are all going to report uh, informed sources in the police department speculating about X, Y, Z organization being responsible. Uh, can the eighth paper afford to ignore it? Uh, this is the practical uh, problem that that we do face. Uh, the other uh, question on covering each each life that uh, was wasted by uh, the fact that it had to be found innocent. So I think these are the kinds of uh, issues that uh, the topic that we've chosen today, reporting terror, throws up. I mean, we have, as I said, a very distinguished team. We have Professor Fezar Mustafa, who is Vice Chancellor of Nalsar University of Law, Professor Hargopal, uh, leading political scientist, and Mr. Dwarka Tirwala Rao, who is Commissioner of Cyberabad. And uh, we will begin this discussion uh, with uh, Professor Fezar Mustafa. We will run through the speakers, uh, one by one, after which we will have uh, a session uh, of Q&A where I would request all of you to uh, you know, frame your questions in as tight and as pointed a manner as possible. And uh, ideally write it down so that we can then read. We also, the event is being live streamed and uh, live tweeted, so um, if there are any people in the social media sphere anywhere in the world who want to put a question to our panel, uh, you are welcome to. My Lord on Queen, Mr. Justice Card June. Mr. Siddharth Vatrajan, Professor Hargopal, Mr. Ram, Major Qadri, other distinguished guests in the audience. Indian media, by and large, is free, objective, and I say with some amount of confidence, friend of minority. In fact, they let minorities battle against Modi. It's a different story, though Siddharth doesn't agree with me that lately it seems that media has accepted Modi as the next Prime Minister of the country. We also have a grievance that at times this friendly media does not fully understand our issues. And I'll quickly pick up a case in point. When a legal Muslim university came up with Muslim reservation, all newspapers said ghettoization, this and that. It was not a reservation solely based on religion. It was a minority institution where they were talking of reservation. It was not Article 15 reservation, it was Article 30 reservation. In fact, Aligarh's reservation policy was a unique reservation policy in the history of affirmative action word over. Because as against the institutional reservation, where you know, less meritorious people were getting admissions, they said that we want to have reservation for Muslims of India, but media did not understand it at that point of time. In India, the terror reporting by media is no different from the Western media, with of course exceptions of papers like Hindu. And His Lordship Justice Kartu has been nation's conscience keeper and has issued any number of statements on media reporting of terror and how judgmental media becomes while reporting terror. And in His Lordship's presence, I should not be speaking too much on this subject. Similarly, Siddharth is the right person to talk on behalf of media on terror reporting. But what I propose to do and say that media is highly sensitive in terror reporting. But sensitive to what? Sensitive to their own ratings and circulation. And equally sensitive to the needs of terrorists. If it is insensitive, it is to the people who are innocent victims of terror incident or innocent victims of prompt police action and police conclusions about the people who were behind the acts of terror. Therefore, before any court of law can find them guilty, media would pronounce its verdict. This morning, I propose to do is just to flag few issues about media-terror relationship. My main thesis is that not only media unnecessarily drags Muslims as soon as any terror incident takes place, and you would listen his lordship on this, this is something which is so deplorable to say the least, but basically media promotes terrorism and aids terrorists. And my second point is, at times, media violates privacy of victims. And my third point is that media reporting of terror adversely affects our psychology, which is, I think, uh, uh, the biggest issue and with which I would conclude. And do at times exploit suffering of victims 
which indeed to me is the worst and most painful part of media reporting of terror. Terrorism's efficacy, like beauty, is in the eyes of the beholder, in that those who commit political violence deliberately directed against civilians believe in the success of their deeds. In one respect, most, if not all, terrorists do achieve an important goal. Whenever they strike, especially if they stage so-called terrorist spectaculars, their deeds assure them massive news coverage and the attention of general public and governmental decision makers in their particular tar target societies. Moreover, given the global nature of the communication system, the perpetrators of international and domestic terrorism also tap into the international media and thereby receive the attention of public and governments beyond their immediate target countries. Former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher once said that publicity is the oxygen of terrorism. Without publicity, terrorism would be like the proverbial tree that falls in the forest and the press is not there to report it and would be as if the incident never happened. It became fiercer. The media became more obsessed with ex exploiting violence as crime and violence as terrorism in search of higher TRP ratings and circulation. As a result, the contemporary news media, especially television, have customarily devoted huge chunks of their broadcast time and news columns to major and minor acts of political violence, supporting the media's critics' argument that mass media, as unwitting as they are, facilitate the media-centered terrorist scheme. In the past, media critics have documented and questioned the mass media's insatiable appetite for violence. They have explored the effects of this kind of media content on people who are regularly exposed to violence in the news and in entertainment. While violence as crime and violence as terrorism tend to be grossly overreported, the coverage of terrorist incidents that provide dramatic visuals is in the league of its own in terms of media attention. With few exceptions, here and there, ordinary criminals do not commit their deeds to attract cameras, microphones, and reporters' notebooks. But for terrorists, publicity is the lifeblood and their oxygen. No other medium has provided more oxygen to terrorism than television because of its ability to report the news instantly, non-stop, and in visuals and words from any place to any parts of the globe a facility that has affected the reporting pattern of other media as well. There was no need to count broadcast minutes or measure column lengths to establish the proportion of total news that dealt with Black Tuesday 9-11 and its aftermath. For the first five days after the terror attack, television and radio networks covered the disaster around the, around the clock without the otherwise obligatory commercial breaks. There simply was no other news. Eventually one wondered whether terrorism coverage needed to be curtailed so that other important news got the attention it deserved. Newsweek and Time, for example, devoted all cover stories in the eight weeks following the event of September 11 to terrorism and terror-related themes. Received the attention of all Americans, the general public and the world leaders alike this level of media coverage was a perfect achievement as far as attention getting goal in the United States was concerned. In the 10 weeks following the attack of September 11, Time magazine depicted Osama bin Laden three times and President George W. Bush twice on its cover. During the same period, Newsweek carried bin Laden twice on its cover and President Bush not at all. Finally, the cover of Newsweek's 11th issue after September 11 featured President George W. and Lady First Lady Laura Bush. From the terrorist point of view, it did not matter that Bin Laden earned bad press in the United States and elsewhere. Singled out, condemned, and warned by leaders such as President Bush and Tony Blair, Osama Bin Laden was in the news as frequently as the words legitimate leaders or even more frequently. This in itself without any sensitivity. And whatever happens in West has happened in India as well. When the broadcast media played and replayed the recorded exchanges between victims in the World Trade Center and emergency police dispatchers, this recently happened in Joseph Nagar as well. 
They exploited the unimaginable suffering of those who were trapped and soon died in the stuck towers, criticizing this practice as prime time pornography. One commentator wrote, and I quote, Can there be anybody on the planet who failed to immediately grasp the full horror of what went on September 11 that they need to hear over and over the emotional mayhem of ordinary people trying to cope, cope amidst overwhelming disbelief, fear and terror not to mention grief. But in our show and tell culture, there is nothing so private and sensitive that it cannot be exposed and sensationalized, especially where ratings are involved. One can perfectly agree with this insistence on journalistic ethics as I do and still wonder whether the show and tell culture has not only desensitized broadcasters but also confused the public's distinction between private and public sphere. One political columnist identified the greatest danger of journalism and I quote, our new obsession with terrorism will make us its unwitting accomplices. We will become and have already partly become merchants of fear. And I will conclude with this theme. Now, terrorism and media are not bad fellows. They are more like partners in a marriage of convenience in that terrorists need all the news coverage they can get and media need dramatic, shocking, sensational, tragic events to sustain and bolster their TRP ratings or circulation. There is no doubt that the most fundamental responsibility of a free press is to inform the public of events and issues in order for citizens to make informed judgments and decisions. Therefore, it would be absurd to suggest that there should be no reporting on terrorism. This is not my case. Government censorship is not an acceptable option either. At issue is how to report on this kind of political violence in ways they, that are less accommodating to terrorists' mass-mediated goals and less likely to curtail the watchdog role of press that is essential for a healthy democracy. People being either terrorist or their sympathizer enjoys white currency today. While it is true that some of most disastrously terror attacks that India has witnessed in recent years have been the handiwork of some Muslims. And this is something that the vast majority of Indian Muslims themselves deplore. It is also undeniable that Muslims have been unfairly blamed for many other attacks or alleged terror plots by the police as well as media in which they had no role to play at all. Many Muslims and others to believe that these false allegations are not innocent errors but can be said to represent deliberate and concerted efforts to defame and demonize the entire community and religion with which uh, it is associated. And we know the column 9 report about Karnataka where they looked at the vernacular press and the English press also to find out number of cases where you know the material was in Urdu therefore it must be the jihadi literature. And similarly, you know, they will pick up a picture of some Darga and say that there was some Pakistani flag. A number of journalists admitted in this report that 60% uh, of whatever reports they gave were false. I would conclude but by saying simply this, that media should deal with moral question. Media could make clear that for breaking a law on moral grounds to be justifiable, the moral position appealed to must be sound and justifiable. The result of current terror reporting about which you would be listening is lordship. The perverse result is that we may become the terrorist's silent allies. Terrorism is not just about death and destruction. It's also about creating fear, sowing suspicion, undermining confidence in public relation, leadership, provoking people and government into doing things that they might not otherwise do. It is an assault as much on our psychology as on our bodies. Thank you very much. Other dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, good morning everybody. I would like to present a few observations from my own experience more to do with the local things that have happened in the recent years and uh, the past few days. I would like to say that the certain happenings, if reported by media, true in its entirety, 
will not make much of a disturbance in the society. However, the issues like a major riot, a riot can be something like, if you can recall, uh, a major riot that took place after the murder of Vangaviti Mohan Ranga in Vijayawada, or 2010 communal uh, incidents in Hyderabad, or the recent uh, terror uh, incident that took place in uh, Dilshuk Naga. This kind of uh, scenario, even if the truth is, truth is reported in its entirety, is likely to cause up some kind of a disturbance. One, in the minds of people, it can, you know, if, if a particular video clip is repeatedly shown, it can even cause a serious traumatic uh, uh, trauma in the minds of the people, or it can uh, cause serious uh, psychiatric uh, disorders, or of course, from the law and order point of view, a further right or a further law and order issue. So I have a feeling that sometimes, you know, uh, the media has to uh, have a lot of restraint and a balance while reporting uh, news. One, the news as it is. Number two, creating the news, which happens number of times. The certain not so responsible and not so sensitive ways of reporting of news. For example, glorifying the criminal acts or the individuals who are perpetrating crime. I'm not really referring to even no, uh, only referring confining to terror uh, incidents. I'm sure you would be able to recall some time back an interview of uh, one Motusinu coming on various TV channels saying that I have committed this murder of Parital Ravi to see, you know, uh, uh, smile in the eyes of so and so, Suri, Suri Baba, my brother in law Suri or something. And that's glorified, you know, the TV channels gone, you know, uh, inter interview him and show it in the sense, each feed off uh, uh, from each other, which uh, the terrorists always wants, you know. Any terrorist wants, uh, because when I was a professional, I was going to, uh, I was attached to Punjab police, then at that time we were talking about Sikh terrorism, we were uh, exposed to that. That time also we told the same thing, the publicity is the most important thing for the terrorist. The propaganda of the deed and the propaganda of fear, that's what he wants. In that, I only wish, and I, uh, I, I want the media not to join hands with them, and you know, uh, aid them. I can again relate to the recent incident that happened in Dish uh, First, if you are. The only way to tackle terrorism and control arbitrary power of the state is to strengthen the society. And society, an enlightened society, it can be created if only you give balance in information, information on both the sides, and also go to the cause issue. And then perhaps we can create a public opinion against the terrorism. Otherwise, these times are very bad. There is a neoliberal model of development and they want to push through the model of development through any method and they don't mind pushing the model of development on the dead bodies of the human being. The model is very cruel. <laughs> model is very inhuman. And that inhuman model has to be pushed through. If it is through Narendra Modi, they don't mind through Narendra Modi. If it is through somebody else, they don't mind pushing it through. But they want the model to be pushed through, not through human values not by humanizing the society. I think we are living in a very bad times. And therefore, I think media has great responsibility. I compliment Hindu for organizing this seminar, particularly in Hyderabad, which is already slipping. We are all worried. It's slipping. And we have to somehow recover the Hyderabad culture, composite culture of Hyderabad, and save Hyderabad, and perhaps also think of a better, more humane world. I think it, to that cause, if this contributes, we'll be very happy. Thank you very much. honor for me to be invited here. And uh, I heard the speeches of the previous speaker. I want to give my own views. In my opinion, the cause of terrorism is a feeling of injustice. Because injustice breeds despair, and despair breeds terrorism. Now, there are two reasons for the injustice. Firstly is poverty and secondly is discrimination. Let us first take poverty. You see, uh, 
before the industrial revolution, which started in Western Europe, in England, and then France, and then spread all over the world, starting from middle 18th century and so, there were agricultural feudal societies everywhere. Now, the uh, feudal methods of production were so primitive and so backward that very little wealth could be generated by that method of production. For instance, in India, the bullock was used for tilling the land. There were no tractors. In some countries like Vietnam, the buffalo was used. In Europe, the horse was used for tilling the land. So, the feudal method of production had such primitive implements, such primitive tools of production, that very little wealth could be generated by the, the feudal economy. So, since very little wealth was generated, obviously only a few people could be rich because when the cake is so small, very few people can eat it. So, the only people who were rich were these kings and these um, dukes and earls in India, the Maharajas, Amidars. 99% or more people had to be poor because there was so little wealth generated. Now, this situation has dramatically changed after the Industrial Revolution and a unique situation has developed in world history. That modern industry is so powerful and so big that enough wealth can be generated to give a decent life to everyone. <coughs> it has never been created earlier in, in world history that so much wealth can be generated by modern industry that everybody can get a decent income, decent employment, decent health care, decent education and so on. Now since this unique situation has emerged in world history for the first time, yet 80% of the people are poor, so the these 80% are saying that when we do not have to be poor now, then why should we be poor? Earlier we had to be poor because so little wealth was generated by the feudal economy. And they are justified in saying so. Why should we remain poor? And therefore, uh, the 21st century will be a century characterized by the struggles of the peoples all over the world for a decent life, for a life which can be called a dignified human existence. This whole century will witness these struggles, which are basically for getting a decent life, which now is possible for the first time in world history. You see, unless people get uh, decent lives, you can't abolish terror. What is an unemployed young man to do? Tell me. Either he commits, he has two options. Either he commits suicide or he becomes a criminal or terrorist to feed his stomach. There are only two options. What will you do, Mr. Police Commissioner, supposing you get unemployed, you have no money, nothing. Either you will hang yourself or you become a terrorist to, to feed your some Somebody comes, give you a weapon and says, take 10,000 rupees a month and start firing whomever you have. No, look at it from the realistic point of view. Nodding your head will not do. See the realities. Why people become terrorists? Because unemployed, they, they, they're not getting a human existence. They're not getting human livelihood. So poverty is one of the basic causes. And until you abolish poverty, you are not going to abolish terrorism. Keep having all your police force and military force. It won't do. If you want to abolish poverty, abolish the basis of terrorism. Uh, if you want to abolish terrorism, you have to uh, abolish its basis, that is poverty. If poverty breeds terrorism out of despair. And now people do not have to be poor. Anymore. You have to create a social order, which is a just social order, where everybody gets a human and decent life. Until you do that, you will never be able to abolish terrorism. Have all your police force and all your military force, you will not be able to do it. People are in, uh, determined to have human lives, decent lives, and they are justified. And it is possible now, in view of the Industrial Revolution, to give everybody a human existence, a civilized existence. Secondly, second cause of injustice is discrimination. You see, in this connection, I permit me to take a few minutes. See, you must understand what is this country, India, because very few people know what is India. See, this is a country of immigrants. It's like North America. In North America, people came mainly from Europe over the last four, five hundred years. In India, people have been coming for thousands of years, mainly from the Northwest. 92, 93 percent people living in India today, perhaps all of us sitting here, are not descendants of the original inhabitants. Our ancestors came from abroad, mainly from the Northwest. 
and they came up into India because people migrate from uncomfortable areas to comfortable areas. Why will anybody migrate from India to say Afghanistan, which is cold, covered with snow four or five months in a year, rocky, mountainous, if you see Afghanistan, scenes of Afghanistan on your TV screen, it looks like a desert, uncomfortable. Everybody wants comfort. So for thousands of years, years people have been pouring into India because this was a country which was paradise for agriculture. It has level land, it has fertile soil, plenty of water for irrigation, rivers, lakes and all. This is what is required for agriculture. And therefore, it gave a comfortable life. For thousands of years, people have been pouring in. And that is why you have so much diversity. Because each group of immigrants who came here brought their own uh, ways of life, their religion, their language, etc. And that is why you have so many religions, so many castes, so many languages, so many ethnic groups. Tremendous diversity. And the only policy, therefore, which can work is the policy of the great Emperor Akbar, who gave equal respect to all communities. And today, what India is today, I tell you, it is the creation and gift of Akbar. Whatever you people are today, the foundation was laid by the great Emperor Akbar and of course continued by, uh, in recent time, by Pandit Jawad and Nehru and, and all who gave a secular con constitution to this country. Yet there is discrimination, particularly against minorities, both in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh. See, a fake country, all the Western supermarkets, if you go there, North America, Europe, they are packed with Chinese goods. Chinese are selling the same high quality goods with the Western manufacturer make, but it doesn't have the price. Indian labor is even cheaper than Chinese labor. If we become a modern industrial giant, then obviously now we have all the potential. We did not have the potential in 1947 because the British policy was to keep us unindustrialized so that India may not emerge as a powerful industrial nation and become a rival to British industry. So they did not allow a heavy industrial base to be laid to. But after 1947, under the vice leadership of Pandit Nehru and his colleagues, a heavy industrial base was created. And now we have thousands and thousands of outstanding engineers, managers, technicians, they're manning Silicon Valley, the science and mathematics faculties of American universities are full of American uh, of Indian professors. We have all, now we have, all, we have potentially a, 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 a highly industrial power, but not in reality. Because the, best, the whole game is India must not be allowed to become a modern industrial giant. Because if it does, it will eliminate whatever is left of Western, uh, uh, Western economy. Chinese have become one Frankenstein monster, this will become another Fra Fra Frankenstein monster. All this religion, they created this fake country called Pakistan, which is no country. You cannot have a, a theocratic state in this subcontinent because there is such diversity. You have to have secularism. Secularism does not mean that you cannot practice your religion. Secularism means religion is a private affair, unconnected with the state. You will not put any pressure on me, I cannot put any pressure on you. Then there is no problem. But what is in reality happening? In reality, this uh, British seed of hatred which they sowed after 1857 is bearing fruit even now. In 1857, there was 0% communalism in this country. There were differences between Hindus and Muslims, yes. Hindus used to go to temples, Muslims used to go to mosques. But there was no hatred, no enmity, they used to help each other. If you read the letters of Mirza Ghalib, Siddharth is a great Urdu scholar, you might be knowing. Mirza Ghalib has written many letters to his Hindu friends, Munshi, Shivnarayan, Aram, Harbupal, Tufta, and all. Very affectionate letters. Very affectionate letters. Very affectionate letters. All the, the, uh, the Muslim rulers in India, Mughal emperors, the Nawab of Awal, Tipu Sultan, uh, Nawab uh, Mushidabad, they were very secular. They promoted communal harmony in their own interest. Because you know, if you are a Muslim ruler with 80-90% of your population as Hindu, if you break temples, there will be a revolt every day, turmoil every day. No ruler wants it. Everybody ruler wants to have a jolly good time. Live in peace. So in their own interest, every one of them they give, uh, Muslim rulers give grants to Hindu temples rather than breaking. Tipu Sultan used to give grants to 156 Hindu temples annually. The Nawab of Awad used to organize Ram Leela, uh, organize Holi Diwali, and Hindus used to participate in Eid celebration and so on. In 1857, when the great mutiny broke out, 
and Hindus and Muslims jointly fought against the British. After crushing that, the British decided that the only policy which can work in the subcontinent, how we can control it, is divide and rule. Make Hindu Muslim fight with each other. So the letters came from the Secretary of State for India in, in London to the uh, uh, Viceroy. Make Hindu and Muslim fight with each other. The English collector would secretly call the Hindu pandit, give him money, and say tomorrow start speaking against Muslims. And he similarly would call the Muslim Malvi, give him money, and say from tomorrow start speaking against the Hindu. This poison was injected year after year, decade after decade. Mid to Mal Mali reform 99, separate electorates were introduced. Hindus can only vote for Hindu candidate. Muslim can only vote. This poison was instilled year after year, decade after decade, until it resulted in this partition of 1947, which is a fake partition. I do not accept it. Pakistan is a Farsi country, fake country. And one day, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh will reunite, make it 15, 20 years, because those who have divided us will not easily allow us to reunite, let me tell you. The whole game will be destroyed. They would still want us to keep fighting. But we will reunite in 15, 20 years under a strong, secular, modern-minded government. Today, what is the situation? That there is discrimination against minorities in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh. In India, Muslims are a minority. There is discrimination against Muslims in various ways. And this, rise to, this gives rise to injustice and therefore to, to terrorism. Whenever a bomb blast takes place, or some such incident takes place, within an hour or so, the TV channels start, many TV channels, maybe not all of them, start showing that an email has come, or an SMS has been received, that Indian Mujahideen have claimed responsibility, or Jaisa Muhammad have claimed responsibility, or Harkat ul Bihar has claimed it, some Muslim name. Now, an email, SMS can be sent to any mischievous person, but when you start showing it within one hour on the TV screens and next day in print, what is the subtle message you are sending? The subtle message you are sending is that all Muslims are terrorists. They have nothing to do except throw bombs. You are demonizing the entire Muslim community and promoting communism. Is it a responsible behavior of the media? I think it is totally irresponsible. You are promoting communism in this country and this is very bad. I have raised my voice against it and media people say, oh, Justice Card, who wants to, uh, you know, uh, the suppress media freedom. You have a freedom to spread communalism. You have a freedom to do all kinds of wrong things, devilish things. You will be stopped from doing devilish things. Yes, I am the strongest fighter of India. I am the strongest fighter of India, but I will tell you, I will not allow you to do devilish things. You will have to act responsibly in the national interest. Unfortunately, Muslims are uh, discriminated against in various ways, in getting jobs, in getting bank loans, houses on rent, in various ways. There is a sense of great injustice <coughs> uh, among the... Uh, you will not be able to survive for one day, I can tell you. There is so much uh, diversity in this country that unless you adopt the policy of the great emperor Akbar and his successor Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, you cannot keep this country united for one day. There is such tremendous diversity. What is there common between you and that boy of Nagaland? You are Hindu or Muslim, he is a Christian. You have got Caucasian features, he has got Mongoloid features. You live on the plains, he lives on the hills. Your eating habits are different, your dress habits are different. Such diversity. So unless you make him feel equal, give respect to everybody, you cannot hold this country together. There is such tremendous diversity. It will break up into 100 pieces. It would have broken up in 1947 had you not had a secular constitution. And it is the greatness of Pandit Nehru and his colleagues. In 1947, when religious passions were inflamed, Hindus and Muslims were butchering each other like animals. Pakistan had declared itself an Islamic state. At that time, to say that India will not be a Hindu state, it will be a secular state was a great achievement to keep your head cool when people have all losing your head, losing their balance. It's a great achievement. And because of that stability, we have more stability than Pakistan everywhere, every day. Uh, you hear 60 people, Shias killed in a bomb blast in Karachi, 100 Shias killed in a bomb blast in Quetta. It has become a madhouse. It was bound to become. Kaisi chalega? 
आप बना ही नहीं सकते इस्लामिक स्टेट आप न न कि हिंदू स्टेट आपको सेकुलर स्टेट बनाना पड़े आपने बना दिया पाकिस्तान ने इस्लामिक स्टेट पहले तो नॉन मुस्लिम अहमदिया नहीं मुस्लिम है फिर आपने कहा शिया नहीं मुस्लिम है फिर सुनील में जो बंदी बरेलवी आपने कहा बरेलवी नहीं मुस्लिम ये तो पागल बन है भाई अरे तुमको जो करना है प्रैक्टिस करो ने जो प्राइवेट अफेयर करो हाउ कैन यू यू कैन सरवाइव एंड यू कैन सी द लॉजिकल इनएविटेबल कॉन्सिक्वेंस पाकिस्तान इज बिकम मैड हाउस आपका बच्चा स्कूल जाता है पता नहीं जिंदा कल लौटे कि नहीं लौटे न जाने कोई बम छोड़ा दे पागल खाना हो गया जो यू हैव टू गिव इक्वल रिस्पेक्ट स्टॉप दिस डिस्क्रिमिनेशन अगेंस्ट एनी कम्युनिटी आई एम नॉट ये दो कॉजेज हैं टेररिज्म के नंबर ऑफ पॉवर्टी नंबर टू डिस्क्रिमिनेशन जब तक ये आप खत्म नहीं करेंगे आप कभी टेररिज्म अबॉलिश नहीं कर पाएंगे शुक्रिया Why does the government not impose hefty fines and close down channels, which misreport? Related to this, uh, we have been talking about morals and ethics in reporting. However, don't you feel there is a need of uh, a law to be put in place which can punish uh, papers or channels for fabricating stories which create fear and panic in society? Again, related to this, which authority is competent to receive complaints against the content? telecast on tv channels in india and finally after the arrest of mutiyo rehman from karnataka one newspaper published a front page headline declaring him a terrorist should there be action taken against them uh, and what action has been taken by the press council in india on this mai hindustani mein bolu kya देखिए मैं जब चेयरमैन प्रेस काउंसिल बना था हैं चेयरमैन प्रेस काउंसिल में बना अक्टूबर 2011 में तो मैं प्राइम मिनिस्टर साहब से मिला मैंने कहा देखिए प्रेस काउंसिल एक्ट का अमेंडमेंट करें दो अमेंडमेंट्स करें अभी प्रेस काउंसिल सिर्फ प्रिंट मीडिया को यूज करता है इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मीडिया को यूज करता तो एक अमेंडमेंट लाइए कि इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मीडिया को भी विद इन द परव्यू ऑफ प्रेस काउंसिल एक्ट लाइए उसमें उसको मीडिया काउंसिल ना बना दीजिए और दूसरा अमेंडमेंट कहिए कुछ पावर्स दीजिए अभी हमको सिर्फ पावर्स है टू एडमोनिश और सेंसर प्रेस काउंसिल को फाइन लगाने का पावर नहीं है लाइसेंस सस्पेंड करने का पावर नहीं ये सब दीजिए तो हमने दे तो दिया उनको उसके बाद में गया सुषमा स्वराज जी से मिलने को तो लीडर ऑफ अपोजिशन है लोकसभा मैंने सोचा क्योंकि दोनों नेशनल पार्टी का तो मैंने कहा मैडम ये तो आपका सुझाव था जब आप मिनिस्टर इन्फॉर्मेशन ब्रॉडकास्टिंग की इंडिया गवर्नमेंट ने ये अमेंडमेंट करी थी बोली हाँ ये था मेरा तो अभी कह तो दिया मगर हुआ कुछ नहीं मैंने तरफ से तो मैंने कहा कि कोई पावर दी है बिल्कुल देखिए मीडिया को फ्रीडम का कोई फ्रीडम एक्सलूट नहीं हो सकता एवरी फ्रीडम इज सब्जेक्ट टू रीजनेबल रिस्ट्रिक्शन इन द पब्लिक मैं फ्रीडम बट इट इज सब्जेक्ट टू रीजनेबल रिस्ट्रिक्शन इन द पब्लिक तो बिल्कुल ये पावर हमारे पास आए तो हम चेक लगा नॉर्मली पावर नहीं यूज करेंगे क्योंकि मैं फ्रीडम में नहीं बना मगर इट एक्सेप्शन सर्कमस्टांसिस जहाँ हम कुछ बिल्कुल ही आप गड़बड़ की काम कर रहे हैं नेशनल इंटरेस्ट के खिलाफ कर रहे हैं कम्युनिज्म फैला रहे हैं लोगों को डिफेम कर रहे हैं तो बिल्कुल चेक होना चाहिए हम लोग बना रहे हैं कोर्ट ऑफ लास्ट रिजॉर्ट ये एक ऑर्गेनाइजेशन बना रहे हैं क्योंकि हम लोगों ने महसूस किया कि जो जुडिशल सिस्टम है ये अक्सर जस्टिस नहीं दे पा रही एक वजह है कि सालों लग जाता है केस डिसाइड होने में वो लड़का आमिर था सत्रह साल की उम्र से गिरफ्तार हुआ चौदह साल उसने जेल बिताया और चौदह साल के बाद पाया गया कि बेगुना है अब चौदह साल उसकी जिंदगी कौन उसको लौटाएगा ऐसे सैकड़ों सैकड़ों हजारों केसेज है तो जस्टिस नहीं मिल पा रही है ये सच्ची बात है उसका कई वजह है एक है कि डिले बहुत हो जाता है तो ये कोर्ट ऑफ लास्ट रिजॉर्ट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ही मैं बना रहा हूँ इसका मुझे आइडिया आया था तो स्टैंडी गार्डनर की किताब कोर्ट ऑफ लॉस लास्ट रिजॉर्ट से वो एक अमेरिकन राइटर है जो वो लॉयर थे अमेरिका के बाद में उन्होंने वो पेरी मैक्सन नॉवल भी लिखी उन्होंने किताब लिखी कोर्ट ऑफ लास्ट रिजॉर्ट और उसमें लिखा तो कि वो कई वकीलों ने अमेरिका में एक ऑर्गेनाइजेशन बनाया जिसका नाम था कोर्ट ऑफ लास्ट रिजॉर्ट मेरे घर में साढ़े चार बजे शाम को इनोग्रेशन है मैं पेटर्न हूँ और मिस्टर पाली नारीमान जो
बहुत बड़े मुद्दे हैं हिंदुस्तान के बड़े मशहूर मुद्दे Media reporting more inclusive. I'm not sure what they mean, but let me rephrase that. 